relationship between managed uh, CO2 mineralization and what nature does. And so if you look at my two pictures there, the one on the left, you see the chalk cliffs near Dover in the southeast of England. Well, that's chalk, that's, that's produced by nature. And on the right, you see a monolithic material made of uh, uh, mineralized CO2. So as I uh, move, move through then, we're going to start with this fantastic graphic, which was produced by the finest minds in our graphics department, showing CO2 in the atmosphere, um, making its way to various sinks. And we have here the terrestrial environment. We have aqueous environment. We separated out the weathering of rock there because we can give some figures to that. Um, and on our far, <clears throat> on our far right, we can see a mineralization plant. And under all these environments, um, CO2 is, is basically mediated by chemical and biological reactions. In the top right there, you can see some question marks. This is quite interesting because um, chondrites that have made their way from space down into the Antarctic and have been uh, um, examined have clearly shown that um, CO2 has been mineralized in space in the reaction between water um, and uh, olivine-type minerals. Now, these chondrites are more than 4.6 billion years old, and therefore we can argue that... Uh, Nature has been making, uh, making mineralized CO2 since before the Earth was formed. I'm now going to show you a, a quick video um, to try and set the scene in more detail. I'm standing at the base of a low cliff, not far from Dover in the southeast of England, and the cliff here is made of chalk. Chalk is composed of the skeletons of microfauna, which grew during the Cretaceous, when there was a thermal maximum. Otherwise, there was a lot more CO2 in the atmosphere, and the Earth was a lot warmer. You can argue this is Mother Nature's response to global warming at that time. And this chalk was laid down over 30 million years and is over 1,600 metres thick at its maximum, of which about 500 metres is exposed in the southeast of England. If we're going to address global warming through carbon dioxide utilisation, we've got to do thing, things in human time scales. We need to be looking at uh, tricks that we can pull that take these processes that Mother Nature teaches us about and turns them into industrial processes and back more quickly. What I hold in front of you here is mineralized CO2. It's been mineralized on a waste-based matrix. It's hard, it's monolithic, it's suitable as a construction material. It's made in minutes, not millions of years. And if we can get our act together and we can industrialize these sorts of processes, then we have a good chance of mitigating Gigatons of CO2. So our approach then is to highlight the analogy between uh, natural and managed mineralization, of course with the latter being achieved in human timescales through essentially evaluating waste reactivity with CO2, looking at the direct and indirect CO2 offsets which can be um, achieved by uh, mineralizing in waste, and to compare CO2 to transport in these systems with nature. And there are various ways of, of, of looking at uh, um, managed uh, CO2 uh, uh, processes, but we can think of them very simply um, as being uh, 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 divided into two groups, those at ambient and mild temperatures and pressures, and they're uh, very much um, uh, similar to natural near-surface conditions on, on, on the Earth, and those reactions that are assisted using moderate temperatures and pressures, and, and they're equivalent to subsurface environments. So looking at, our, looking at our graphic here to draw that analogy a little bit uh, more deeply, on the left you see natural carbonates, those that are actively being sequestrated on ocean and land. We've got biological and, and, and chemical mediated reactions. And we have the weathering old to basic rocks. And then below we see um, uh, uh, carbon which is stored in the lithosphere in the mantle. And they're essentially recycled by hydrothermal, carbothermal and magmatic uh, reactions. On the right, we have our accelerated mineralization, our managed process. And if we were to take, for example, five world-occurring residues uh, with a rising of greater than four gigatons, we know from our own work and our own practice that we can get half a gigaton or more of CO2 into those residues and that indirect savings are equally as large. If we go back to the chalk, the chalk that's exposed in the southeast of England, well, there's about 15,000 cubic kilometers and over 30 million years, our back of the envelope uh, calculation tells us that about uh, 400 kilotons of CO2 were mineralized just in this local geographic area on an annual basis. So if you have a look at what we can do with a managed reaction and what nature does, the amounts so that we can, we can manage 
are comparable with those of nature. So what's missing then? Well, we need a clear articulation of, of mineralization technology. We need to give it an understandable reference point, And we definitely need to avoid the black box approach. This is commercially driven, but it's negative, And I think it confuses and undermines um, the credibility of what we're doing. So in terms of uh, projections and way forward, well, you know, we, we can... We can manage mineralization use waste arising, so we're doing it commercially. We can avoid gigatons of CO2. And in respect of the UK's 10-point plan for target emissions reduction, we think we can meet 60% of that target just through mineralizing waste that are produced in the UK. And I, I want to point out that further, CO2 mineralization in waste is here. It's fully commercial in the UK in fixed plants. And... We have mobile carbonation plants operating now which directly use CO2 derived from